is on. Well, everybody, thank you all so much for joining us today. Welcome to the June Wheel Talk that we are so excited to share with you. Thanks to Martin and Kai, who voluntarily are going to be sharing with all of you um, his, their journey, their knowledge, their about performances, about stories, about many different things that, because we need to change the stories and we need to change the narrative. So. You want to um, listen in or if you want me to put my headphones on? Oh, hold on a second, Sue. I'm going to mute you. That's it. <laughs> so um, I just want you to know that the wheel talks are meant, uh, of course, they're going to be talking about a very exciting topic, but this is, um, this is a space for all of us to talk, to share, to share ideas, questions, um, suggestions, and experiences. So even though they're going to take a piece of time of this hour that we're going to be sharing together, um, this is a space for all of you to use the chat while they're talking, if you have any questions or any ideas that you want to share in that specific moment. But then there's going to be the time for the open mic, and everybody will be talking and answering questions and asking questions. So welcome to the um, Wheel Talk. And now Martin and Kai, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. So Martin Otin has a background in marketing, which he now calls the dark side. In 2017, he started developing Vole Halle, that I'm not pronouncing it right probably, together with Kai. He's also working on a documentary about the concept of well-being economies, which will feature wheels Catherine Trebek. I love it how he put it in there. And, um, and Kai Chastel has worked as a freelance journalist for the largest and most respected German magazines, newspapers, and websites. And he has written books and moderated conferences. So Martin and Kay, it's over to you. And um, if you have any questions or anything that I have maybe forgotten, write to me on the chat. Thank you all. Thank you, Martin. Okay. Yeah. Um Thanks so much for having us. This is quite an interesting sort of point to get to. Uh, I've been on a long journey. Catherine knows a lot about this. And part of this journey has been the experience we've had with Volle Halle. And that started in 2017 with Kai and myself. And I'm really grateful that you guys are taking the time to listen to this. I think we have a lot to learn because we're always sort of in our little bubble and trying to figure out what it is that we're doing and have so many sort of transformation thinkers in one group together is quite, quite a, uh, a treat for us. So um, I'll go into the presentation. We have to start with our jingle. Our show has a jingle and we need to play the jingle for you. Um, and then we'll open with a question for everyone quickly to sort of get everyone's point of view. And then I'll have a bit of a, I hope I can get through it in sort of 10, 15 minutes presentation. We'll show a couple of little clips as well from our show. Um, and then we're quite excited about the conversation that we'll have. So um, here goes, bear with me. Uh, need to check right now. All right. And that takes us to a question we wanted to discuss sort of as a warm up little thing with all of you. Um, and the question is, when was the last time you heard someone speak about the climate crisis in a way that inspired you? And what was that? Um, and yeah, and I don't know, do you want to moderate this? Um, but yeah. we're really looking forward to hearing. Is an open mic now. So the question, Martin, if you want to repeat it, because just um, recently two other people join us, if you want to repeat it and then please unmute, I can unmute you all, but I, you know, feel free to do it or raise your hand and I can, I can, I can see you all. So let me know who would like to answer that question. We would like to start with that question. Martin, can you repeat it? Yeah. So following the format of the We All Talks, we're starting with the question, when was the last time you heard someone speak about the climate crisis in a way that inspired you? And why was that? And Titus, it's going to be your turn. You raise your hand and uh, open mic. Yeah. Hi. I listened to the launch of the Race to Zero on the 5th of June. And Mark Carney, who's our former central banker, really talked about what he was doing to mobilize the financial sector. 
And given the financial sector control the purse strings and are very powerful, and central bankers are like masters of the universe, <laughs> the fact that he started by mobilizing the masters of the universe is encouraging because a lot of our politicians are giving out rhetoric, but no, not enough action. Um, I thought our Secretary of State, Alok Sharma, was moderately inspiring and encouraging, uh, but I don't think he really has the backing of his government or our government in the UK. So that's me. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else would like to share? Okay, Sacha, go ahead. Oh, I got very excited being part of the Alan Savory conferences that took place a couple of weeks ago talking about land restoration and it was done for the Spanish-speaking world and it was great to hear what fantastic thing we can do well while we do um, holistic management and cattle grazing in the right way and that was very exciting to hear as well. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Bob, go ahead. Yeah, just building on what uh, Titus was saying um, and the Mark Carney initiatives, uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures did a, a really good job of uh, awakening the risk to the financial community, investors and bankers and so on, if companies didn't get their act together on climate change and at least get ready for it, if not stop contributing to it. And uh, once you get the investor voice starting to uh, be part of the chorus, encouraging companies to pay attention to these things, uh, magic happens. Mm -hmm. So it's been a catalyst for a catalyst, uh, the investment community to awaken uh, businesses to the relevance of all of these factors, especially climate change, to their success, both current and future success. Climate change, of course, is not the entire bundle of sustainability. It's one piece of it, but it's a big piece of it. And uh, it is a, a lightning rod for companies to understand that some of the things that they used to consider as externalities uh, are now much more relevant and material to their success than they used to be. So it's a wake up call. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Catherine, you're next. And Sue, yeah. you're gonna be the next one. <laughs> really, really quickly, there's um, a member of We All Youth, an amazing young guy here in Scotland called Sam, and he just so powerfully puts um, this was last year, so pre-COVID, and he uses this beautiful phrase. He says, we have long known because of social injustices that we need to transform the economy. The climate crisis gives us a decade to do so. And I think just combining the two in that really powerful, you know, the clock has started now. Humanity, get your act together. I just, I find that, and I quote it all the, all the time so proudly. And I think now the update to that would be, and now COVID proves that it's possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine, too. Go ahead. Yeah, just to pick up on the, the, the other two who spoke before Catherine, um, the most inspiring conversation I had recently was with my investment portfolio manager. I rang him up to ask about transferring more of my investment to green funds and so on. And I was talking to him about environmental and social governance goals. And he was telling me that they were really concerned that these things were not just greenwash. I didn't say it to him. He said it to me. <laughs> that was a result. I mean, I can yeah. hear, have these conversations with loads of friends and people I know are environmentalists. When it comes back to me from my financial advisor, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> All right. That's really exciting too. Kai, your turn. So I had the opportunity to have a Zoom call with the founder of Alnatura, which is a brand for um, products and also a supermarket um, uh, brand. And uh, his name is Götz Rehn. And I asked him uh, whether um, he is sometimes frustrated by seeing that, for example, Maya Göpel, which is a friend of Catherine, uh, who wrote a book called To Think in a New Way About Our World, um, to see that uh, books like that one is now so popular um, and he worked for that change uh, the last 30 years. 
and whether he is frustrated and want to uh, bit in the edge of a table or is happy about that. And he said to me, you know what? An entrepreneur never bites in the edge of a table. And after that talk, I thought to myself, okay, this guy is 70 years old. He has the kind of struggle we have in front of our eyes now since 30 years. And um, if someone like him being 70 years old, is so much of passion and of humor and of love to the uh, people around him. And I have the duty to do that as well. And I was very inspired by that. Wonderful. Okay. So Martin, I'm going to pass it on to you so you can continue if everybody did it. Yeah, I'm not missing anyone. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. You're on mute, Martin. Sorry. Yeah. There we are. Um, I'm going to, you know, draw on for a bit and hopefully I'll still find you awake when I'm done. Um, can you all see my chart? Good. Yes, we, yeah. Um, I'm starting maybe with what we sometimes ask ourselves. What is for Halle? This is four photographs we took at the last show we gave before COVID uh, put us out of work. Um, is this a stage show about the climate crisis or is this maybe more of a public dialogue about left versus right, politically speaking? Or is this just a new transformational narrative? We don't know. Maybe at the end of this, you can tell us because we, we would like to understand what we are and what it is that we do. Um, just a, as a little vocabulary help. So Voller Halle as a German term was basically meant as a joke by Kai. He tends to make jokes every now and again. You'll find this out in the second half of the session. Um, and he just said, we call our thing Voller Halle and Voller Halle sort of loosely translates to full house. It just says a room full of people. And to me, that's important because it shows you that we're not using any sustainability, green or other terminology in the way we talk about what we do. And that will be a sort of a bit of a recurring theme in what I'm going to talk about. Um, so Kai and I began in early 2017. He was a journalist who was excited about the Paris Agreement and completely frustrated with the fact that the media didn't seem to want to hear about all the changes the world was going to go through now. And I'd come, as, as Anna was saying, I'd come from the dark side. And after the Trump election, I realized that I had to do something. And so we joined forces and we, you have to remember, this was before Greta. This was before Fridays for Future. This was before media were interested in discussing the climate. Um, and we kind of called it sometimes a form of self-defense. If no one was going to hear us in the public media or in the, so the public, in the, um, in the mass media, we would just take to the stage and... and sort of get on the stage and, and do our little rant there, as it were. So we were a bit, you know, kind of two angry white <laughs> men on a stage. Um, uh, and, and that was a weakness we had. And we knew that, but that's just who we were. And the first show we put on was 70% about the climate crisis. This is just a rough guesstimate of mine. And then 30% about other crises and other things that our democracies are struggling with. Um, and we were basically experimenting with the form. We were trying to figure out how can you go on a stage and do something with an audience that they feel is unlike things they've seen before, that talks about <laughs> the crises that we're in, in ways that are inspiring, hopefully. And it looked like this. So this is Kai at the very top of our show back then, reading from a book by a guy who had gone to the Himalayas and found a valley where people were doing everything they could to live sustainably because they'd found that their valley could only support so much exploitation. And so they changed their way of living a hundred years ago. And Kai read from that book and we showed photos from that valley. That was the start of, of the show more or less, or, you know, we would have schematics and charts and we would have talk about amazing people we met. And I even had an interview with Tim Jackson. Now, Tim wasn't on stage with me, we had a film where he left gaps in a monologue that he spoke and improvised for us and I spoke into those gaps. So we were basically making a big stage experiment in an empty hall that we'd rented and we managed to, you know, get 200 people to show up that night and we were quite happy. Um, yeah, and that was, that was basically how it began. So in 2017, we started Kai and Myself with our premiere it was basically sort of a show about progressive politics and it was a mix between film, music, photography, 
visualizing things with graphics and literature. And, you know, you could sort of reframe it as sort of a two hour multimedia politics TED talk with, you know, interesting people showing up on the screen as our guests on film. Um, the year after we experimented with the form, we did around five shows. It might've been six or six, I'm not quite sure about the number, but we sort of tried to turn this two hour juggernaut into a one hour thing, into a snappier thing. We focused on the climate, we varied with the lengths, we experimented with things and we kind of, it became more of a one hour crisis talk. And essentially that was a failure. The first show, the two hour thing had worked in some ways quite well, in other ways it didn't, but it had definite strengths. And then as we were sort of trying to condense it and make it more urgent and make it more focused, we began failing because we basically violated an imp important rule we'd given ourselves. We had promised to people that we would not be patronizing or gloomy. And then we were exceedingly patronizing and gloomy. So we really failed people's expectations. There was one particular incident where we gave a show that a cousin of mine had organized for us in his town. And we gave the show and afterwards people came to us wide eyed and saying, that's how you want to inspire people? I'm depressed now. So, so lit, really these first two years, that was a bit of a testing things and failing. And we had to move away from being patronizing and gloomy. So the next year, we actually managed to go beyond what we'd done before. We were invited by a conference that has a high visibility in Germany. It's called Republika. And, and we, we wrote an 85% different program and we expanded our team. By that time, we had found two more people who were gonna be there with us, a, a friend of mine and a friend of Kai's. And, and gladly, the friend of Kai's brought a very different flavor to it because she is an actor She's a singer and she has just a different presence from angry white men ranting on a stage. She just gave the whole thing a different vibe and that enabled us to basically do a show at that, at that conference that opened up a whole lot of opportunities for us and we ended up doing 15 gigs across the country. And that show was sort of a 40-60 mix. The first 40% of the show, we talked about the problem. We tried to teach people in a way that was fun and engaging how severe the problem was. And then we spent 60% of our time talking about those people who had solutions, sort of our heroes. We presented five of them um, who had answers for what we could do in our daily lives. So heroes for our everyday life changes. What we learned in that year was that this was not enough. In terms of what it was telling people about the climate crisis, it was falling short in the sense that it focused on individual responsibility. And, you know, and it, it dawned on us that we would basically not be, we weren't honest enough. We weren't genuine with what the issue was. We had to get, get bigger than just saying, you know, think about compensating for your CO2 emissions or, you know, think about um, donating or to, 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 to good purposes and whatnot. So we wrote a completely new show over the winter 1920 that was basically that, that became a kind of well-being economies narrative of sorts. It was, we sometimes called it from schnitzel change to system change, you know, recognizing that people's own consumption and usage habits were always just the starting point for anyone to go to a, a bigger understanding of what sustainability means. And we try to walk that path as well from the a conversation between two protagonists on stage, our other, our two friends, Michael and Maren, they would be two characters on a stage having a conversation about coming from those two very different viewpoints, a conservative business person and a young in her twenties activist person. And we let them clash on a stage and we, we explored what that meant, what that conversation meant, if, if it was ongoing rather than breaking up because there was just too much opposition. So essentially we wrote kind of a, a, a we all show of sorts. And that's why I was so excited to, to share that here uh, with you guys today. Um, the next thing I'd like to show, we didn't translate this, but this is a 60 second little trailer we've cut off that show we did um, in March. 
It's 60 seconds. It's only German. I tried to subtitle it. It was impossible because it's too quick and too snappy, but you get a vibe at least of what that is. Um, and I'll just play that for you quickly to show you sort of how the show feels. Entschuldigung, ist hier noch frei? Also ja, bitte. Soziale Gerechtigkeit schaffen, Klima retten. Ah, Klima. Unser Grundwasser ist vergiftet. Die Insekten sterben weg. Der Wald geht vor die Hunde. Energie, Ernährung, Gebäude, Verkehr, Steuern. Alles steht auf dem Prüfstand. Was meinen Sie denn mit Wachstum? Dass irgendwelche Kurven des Bruttoinlandsprodukts nach oben zeigen? Das ist doch völlig irre. Was soll denn das für ein Argument sein, bitte? Der Gemeinsinn ist angeboren, der Egoismus kommt später. Die Klimakrise aufhalten, die Welt gerechter gemacht, umgesteuert. Bist du betrunken, Mutzele? Those yellow titles, they say it's a conversation that we must have now. What's the world that we want to live in? So it doesn't talk about the climate crisis, sort of. It talks about what world do we want to live in? Um, and sort of that takes me to the question, what is this for Halle? You know, back to what I said at the beginning. I think we can agree that it's a type of a performance on stage. I put performance in quote marks because I think performance might sometimes lead you to think it's, you know, acrobatics and it's clowns doing things. But it is a form of a performance. It's mainly spoken word, us talking in various roles and sort of contexts, enhanced by films that deliver us protagonists and music that sort of segues between bits. We have characters, we have roles, and it combines journalism and entertainment. And nothing about it, at least on the outside, says green or sustainable. We don't use that vocabulary when we talk about it. And now I have two excerpts from the show, which we subtitled. The first one shows you Kai, who's in the, in the call with us. Um, at, the top, at the very top of the show, he's walking into the room as people are expecting the show to start. And he's basically pretending to be the janitor, the custodian of the building, kind of having a bit of a folksy call, conversation with the audience before everything kicks off. And then as he's sort of talking about what he thinks a good life is, the following happens. Die Margot, die hat ja jetzt seit neuestem einen Spleen, die ist jetzt Vegetarierin. Da sage ich zu Margot, du Margot Spätzle, für mich ist das nichts. Ich esse keine Blumen, ich brauche meine Seidewürschle. Und dann braucht man als Schwabe eigentlich nur noch zwei Dinge zum glücklich sein. Das eine ist eine Flugreise, möglichst weit weg und klar, möglichst günstig. Und das andere ist mein Daimler. Da sage ich immer, mein K ist mein Kassel. Und wenn dann an der Ampel auf einmal dieses Au Ach, verzeih jetzt, das ist mir jetzt aber unangenehm, Moment. Da muss ich jetzt kurz ran. Ich hab's gleich, Moment. Hallo, wer ist denn am Telefon? Ich bin durch. Hallo, Papa? Verzeih jetzt, ich mir unangenehm. Hallo, Margot Spätzle, bist du das? Nein, nicht Margot. Ich bin Marion, deine Tochter. Ha, freilich. Meine Tochter ist zwei Jahre alt und schläft gerade auf der anderen Seite ein. Liebes Fräulein, dürfte ich Sie vielleicht... Nein. Ich bin die Erwachsene, Marion. 59 Jahre alt. Alt. Ja, freilich. Und ich bin der heilige St. Nikolaus, gell? Liebes Fräulein, ich bin für einen Spessel ja gern zu haben, aber jetzt ist es ein bisschen ungünstig. Nein, und deswegen... nein, warte, warte. Als ich zwei war, hatte ich den Unfall auf dem Spielplatz mit der Schaufel. Daher kommt die Narbe am Fuß. Und du hast mich immer Mutzele genannt. Mein Mutzele? Aber wie kann es denn sein? Du bist doch noch so klein. Das kann sein, weil ich dich aus der Zukunft anrufe. Wir haben jetzt das Jahr 2075. Ich lebe in Nordnorwegen. Wir mussten während der Südeuropakriege in der großen Flüchtlingswelle hierher fliehen. In die VSNE. Was? VSNE, Mutzele? Was ist jetzt das? Vereinigte Staaten von Nordeuropa. Norwegen, Schweden, Finnland, Estland. Ach, du bist in Skandinavien. Aber da ist schön ruhig, oder? Ruhig? Naja, Norwegen hat heute 250 Millionen Einwohner. Was? Vor allem aus Indien, Pakistan, Zentralafrika Was? und natürlich die ganzen Europäer. In der gesamten VSNE gibt es 550 Millionen. 
So arguably that's not inspiring. That's, but you know, that's how we start. We don't need to inspire from the top. Um, the next bit I'll sh share with you is just as long, another couple of minutes and then we're done, um, is a section of the dialogue between the two protagonists that you saw in the trailer. Um, you have, there was this first segment where they, they met in a cafe by chance and they have a conversation and it ends with the business guy saying to the woman, you know what, you just want communism back, isn't that it? And she storms off. And then in the second segment that they have together, she comes back and you see what happens. Oh. Espresso ist richtig, oder? Ja, wunderbar, passt. Vielen Dank. Ich meine, aber, wissen Sie, wenn man... Wenn man nur einen Zentimeter über unser System nachdenkt, dann müssen Sie doch nicht gleich mit der Kommunismuskeule kommen. <lacht> ja. <lacht> Aber schauen Sie, Sie erzählen mir jetzt auch die ganze Zeit, dass sich hier alles ändern muss. Ja? Was ich sehe, sind Leute, die demonstrieren oder irgendwie so durch die Gegend fordern. Aber Leute, die wirklich Lösungen haben, sehe ich keine. Und wenn Sie mir andauernd immer nur sagen, was alles nicht mehr geht und was verboten gehört. Ja, dann ist das für mich einfach keine Diskussionsgrundlage. Ja. Ja, das verstehe ich. Sie wollen Lösung, ja? Ja, ich bitte darum. Weil es, es gibt ja Lösungen. Es gibt ja ganz tolle Leute und Initiativen und Projekte, ja, die nach vorne denken, die stehen nur vielleicht nicht in ihrer schlauen Zeitung da. Aber die gibt es. Und also ich, ich habe zum Beispiel im Studium Leute kennengelernt. Ja? Die führen ihr Unternehmen nach den Regeln der Gemeinwohlökonomie. Kennen Sie das? Die meisten Unternehmen sind ja sehr zahlenfokussiert. Und leider konzentrieren die sich dann immer nur auf Zahlen wie Gewinn und Umsatz. Und die Idee von der Gemeinwohlökonomie ist, andere Kategorien in den Vordergrund zu stellen wie zum Beispiel Menschenwürde, Gerechtigkeit, ökologische Nachhaltigkeit und Transparenz. Und in diesen Kategorien werden dann Punkte vergeben. Und wenn man da besonders viel macht, dann bekommt man halt viele Punkte. Und wenn man nicht so viel macht, nicht so viele. Just an excerpt. What's really hard to do is to, to weave sort of that type of explanation and presentation into a narrative of a conversation. We struggle quite a bit how to make that seamless and how to make it feel right. But let me come to sort of my little conclusion of what we've learned. Um, there's a number of things. One is when you do something like this, the development never, never ends. The moment you put your first, sh your new show on, you're realizing as you're performing it that it's already outdated and you need to change five things about it. So that's one thing. Don't be patronizing. It's incredibly hard. It's a daily struggle to not be patronizing, but it must be done. It, you, people will just hate you and walk away if you, if you are patronizing, even though you feel like they need to hear you and they need to be taught, but you can't put that in your words. Then there are no easy answers. We, last year, we worked on these ideas that people with, you know, uh, people who had solutions for more bike travel, traffic in the city or for CO2 compensation or for, you know, they, they were giving us the answers and we realized it's bigger than that. It's well-being economy alliance bigger than that. It needs to be a bigger conversation and that makes it hard. Last year, people walked away and said, well, you've given me some inspiring ideas. Now that we've gone bigger, we've gone systemic, it's hard to get people to walk away and say, you've given me some great ideas because the questions we're asking are so huge. Um, embrace the opposition. We're still learning that. We think we'll get even stronger if we make the businessman even more compelling, if we give him arguments that we need to reckon with, if we make him more believable and more, more convincing in a way, because then more of his camp will join our show and will say, I'm being represented and I'm not being talked down at, but I'm being, I'm being talk, spoken with. 
um, language matters. That's incredibly powerful. We found that sometimes if at the end of a show, we frame things for in three sentences in a, in a controversial way, then that language overpowers the entire hour we've done before. So every single word matters. And that also is true in another way where we found that the, where we come from and the thoughts we kind of put together are still often considered by many to be too academic. We are often, we, we talk about, you know, paradigm shifts and we try to explain where that comes from. And we talk about Milton Friedman at some point in the show. And we have these conversations about the economy and many people feel like you're talking to a very specific and fi fairly, fairly small segment of the population. That's something that we're still struggling with. There is hope in community. We find that hope rises out of a joint conversation. The most inspiring events we've had were when the audience was speaking with us and then speaking to one another. And in the room, there was an energy that we created together. And that was quite hopeful. And then learning from the audience is probably the one thing that has been the through line of everything we've done. We have learned with people, we've learned from people, we've always changed our show based on what people were telling us and people make us smarter always do and sort of the summary is we're trying to design an ongoing dialogue between the two groups sort of paradigmatic groups that we've defined rather than standing at the at the on the on the stage and preaching to people that's kind of how we've shifted it Still work in progress. We still haven't cracked it in a way that, you know, millions come to us, but that's where we've come in these three and a half years that we've spent with this now, almost four years. Um, just as a little final note, um, of course, because of Corona, we couldn't go on tour this year like we wanted. We would have actually been able to maybe even make a living back on the back of Fola Halle, but we had to, we had to, you know, cancel everything or things were canceled on us. So we did two things, only digital. We did a, so what we called the climate salon. We did four online sessions like this one where we had one interesting uh, interview guest and we did one hour interviews with them and we edited them and put them on YouTube and we're doing little best, best off versions of that. And then we did a, a half hour film for that very same conference where we last year sort of had our break. In 2019, we had our break at Republica and this year, Republica was this online only conference and we submitted a half hour film that was sort of a combination of the show you saw excerpts from and stuff we shot on our own webcams. And we sort of made a half hour revised version of our show based on, on Corona. Um, that's, that's all I have for the presentation for now. And now uh, Kai and myself are very much looking forward to discussing this with you. I'd be keen to hear what this triggers in you. Are you saying, why are these idiots going on a stage where 50 people can only see them? That's a very valid response. Or are you saying, this makes me think of an amazing project I've seen in Australia? That would be amazing. Like, I'm, I, I just want to know what uh, sort of our little story triggers with you. And of course, we're happy to also clarify anything that I might have not you know, explained properly. Thank you so much, Martin. This has been really interesting. And I, yeah, the principles that you were talking on and the feedback and everything that you have learned through, it's, it's been really, really inspiring. So this is a time for everybody to share and, and respond to Martin's like, please share what all this that you have heard, that you have seen, what it has made you felt, what it has made you think. And um, um, if you are kind enough to use the, uh, raise your hands either physically or using the, the option that is on Zoom, I'll, you know, I can, I can make sure that everybody's gonna be heard. So Titos, we're gonna, find, we're gonna start with you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just, it was lovely to see, and I think it's a great using live theater. And uh, I just wondered if you knew of Augusto Boal's legislative theater, also called Theater of the Oppressed or theater, Forum Theater, mm -hmm. um, which is fabulous. Um, where he goes into communities, asks people questions, gets hold of the issues, really connects with people, does a performance, and then invites people how it could be different. 
so the participants come onto the stage and say, do it like this. And so people are actively part of it. And he, they got involved in elections and they ran this in the barrios in Brazil. He's from, uh, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but they actually drew up legislation with the people using what they called legislative theater. So I can recommend his method. I've just pulled his book off my bookshelf, but it's uh, inspiring stuff. And I think it's often now called forum theater. What's his name again? Um, Augusto. Augusto Boal. Yeah. I put it in the chat. Brilliant. So, Catherine, I noticed that you have a question. You put it on the chat and you have an answer as well regarding this, um, the theater. So if you want to take the turn and then Amanda is going to be you. I'll just explain about, I am always curious about, I mean, the, the public is a huge, 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 um, diverse, multifaceted group of people. And, um, and I guess for different issues, I'm wondering how much are there different sectors, different audiences that are most useful. And, and to give you an example, um, my, my family in Australia, my brother and sister, um, sister-in-law and my parents go to markets every Sunday. And of course my brother and sister-in-law, you know, take their re reusable cups. My mum and dad were never going to be the first people to use reusable cups, but essentially they now, because my brother and sister-in-law are doing it, they take their own crockery cups out of their cupboards. So they're the late adopters. They were never going to be the first audience. So I'm curious on these sorts of stuff. Do you, do you think about who your target, your first audience is? You know, who's the equivalent of my brother and sister-in-law for this sort of message? Or, or do you just blanket coverage it and go for a numbers game? And any tips on how to do that for different issues? Well, I think that I've been struggling with the question of who's our target audience ever since we've started doing this, essentially because we're putting out an open invitation for people to come. Um, we're trying to frame it. That's the only thing I think in terms of thinking in terms of an audience, the only thing we do is we try to not sound green, not use those the, the vocabulary that that you know Greenpeace and the Green Party and and you know the the WWF and all of those people are using, and not even use green as a as a color. I mean, you've seen as black and and yellow the colors that we've been using. That's really all we've done, and I'm still struggling to understand how we could do this differently. I think what we need to do is we need to evolve the vocabulary and the accessibility for people who think differently. That's the key thing that we need to make it palpable for those who say, I don't want to change. I don't see the need for change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come on in. We have your point of view respected. Be there. But to us, it's almost like in my marketing days, I would call this pull marketing. We're just making an offer and then whatever, whoever feels pulled in will be there. I completely see what you're saying. Diffusion of innovation. That's exactly how it goes. You know, you have the early adopters or the innovators who then bring everyone else on board and we're hoping, and that's also why we're trying to, yeah, we're hoping that this will happen. The people who've gone to our show will the, be the ones who will then influence others. There's one example we had, we were in a school in, in the north of Germany and after we'd done our show, there was a young couple sitting in the very first row. They were in their, I think in their teens still. And the, the girl said to us, look, we're at the school, we're the only vegans in the school and everyone makes fun of us. And it's so hard and it's so hard to have that lifestyle and to make that point and to be that person. And I said to her that, I said, look, from your point of view, you, you feel very lonely and you're the only ones. From my point of view, you're wonderful news because in that school too, there are the people who are moving in the right direction. You're the first ones, you're the pioneers. So, so I think what our job is to make the pioneers feel like they're not alone and give them strength. Mm. But the broader we get, the, the more we manage to include the other side, you know, your parents, to take that example, into the conversation and have them re represented on stage, the more I'm hoping that people like that will say to their friends, have a look at that. That is interesting. Mm. That's all I know, because we're not advertising to audiences that we pinpoint. I'm sometimes a little dumbfounded by this sort of target group talk. I don't know, Kai, do you want to add anything to that? Um, for me, there was one crucial moment uh, last year. We were in a school in the south of Germany 
and a couple 17 years old told us after our performance you know what they told us there will be a climate change show we have to go there it starts at half past seven in the morning and we were so bored to go there and after we saw your performance we had goosebumps all over the body all over the time and now we want to be part of the solution and um, have the impression maybe there is a future for us because all oh, they're thinking we lost huge and we also oppressed because uh, you're cutting up speaks about um, um, the, the the dystopian world we are going into so um, yeah. for in, in my mind and we had a talk yesterday about and there's a tradition and he said that as well in my mind um, uh, it's not a matter about um, the state of mind, but the age. And I hope that in the future we can especially reach out to young adults because I think they are the ones who are really keen to have some inspiration and hope in their mind. So this is what I found out last year, which inspired me the most. Thank you, Kai. So Amanda is going to be your turn now, and then Fabio, um, it will be your turn. Hi, yes, Martin, um, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, could you show the principles again that you had? I think it's like the second to last slide. For me, especially at WEAL, I think this is such a great intersection with our narrative and knowledge work, um, sort of the learnings that you had. I personally, I definitely can resonate with a lot of the times engaging, especially with the environmental community, feeling coming out of it feeling really, really depressed. Yeah, and very negative about like the prospects for the world and things like this. So some of the, those principles that you have there. Um, yeah, and I think this idea of like not being patronizing and, and the language is really important. I think also humor is really, really significant in this space. Like I think when you use and invoke humor, it opens people's minds up and makes, it lowers barriers for thinking about things in a different way. and um and sharing i guess and, and some laughter so yeah i just wanted to say i really appreciate it and i'm going to take a picture of, of this now. <laughs> thank you so much amanda um fabio i don't have the image but i re do remember that and vicky you're going to be the next one please uh can can you hear me yes we can yeah, great. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, there's something that I wanted to um, to comment, and then I wanted to ask um, you. Uh, Fabio, the, Fabio, uh, you're, uh, Fabio, yes? you're 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 cutting yes. off. I cannot really understand what you're saying. I don't know if it's your mic or your headphones. Um, can you hear me now? Is better. A little uh, bit better, yeah. Is it, is it better? Well, uh, let let me know if, if you know if, if you can hear me. Otherwise, I'll just write it in the in the chat. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to co comment. Yeah, I wanted to comment on the uh, one of the initial slides, Martin, where um, you showed the year plan, and then you were saying that in two thousand and nineteen you decided to um, to focus. 40% on the problem and 60% of the on the solution, and and I think the uh, reasoning behind that was that the uh, you know that you didn't want to be gloomy and patronizing. Um, but uh, as you were saying that, I was kind of um, I was kind of thinking about it, and 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 I thought that um, well, it isn't the I mean uh, it seems to me that the problem isn't any gloomer than the solutions. I mean, if you think about all the, uh, uh, you know, all, all the people that should lose their jobs in many sectors of society, if you think about all the drastic radical changes that we should um, make to, you know, to tackle climate change, uh, I think uh, actually the solutions are much more gloomer and much more, uh, you know, more problem than problem itself. Um, so I was thinking that maybe it's, you know, maybe success might, you know, you, you, you might get, um, you, you might get more, uh, you, you, might, you might get more success, but not only, 
you know, but by focusing eagerly on both the problem and the solution, because um, probably the you know the, the problem is not the problem, but, but solutions in the fact that, um, that perhaps they're not really ready to make the solutions yet. Um, so yeah, I mean, th this is just something that I, that I was reflecting on as to showing those eyes. Um, that perhaps it's the engagement, uh, not only regarding the solutions, but regarding the problem, uh, regarding the problem as well. Thank you, Fabio. Martin, I oh, don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, the, um, so the, the 40, 60 thing wasn't really by design. It, it just sort of evolved that, evolved that way. We, we, we had certain things that we wanted to communicate and certain ways to communicate it about the state of the world. Um, and we still felt and probably still do today that there is a need to alert people to the fact that we're headed for World War Three, you know, uh, you know, that, that, that people need to be told this because many people don't know this, still don't know this. They think, <laughs> oh, yeah, two degrees more or less, three, four degrees, you know, who cares? We have warmer summers, nice, I'll be by the, by the beach. We need to make sure that people get what, what's at stake. I think that's part of the job. And Fabio, I'm sure you're right when it comes to thinking about the upheaval that we need to go through to address these things, that that's also scary. But at the end of the day, the only chance we have to tell a story that people will want to hear is a story that says we can deal with this in a way that makes our lives better. And I think the, the, the big story, and we haven't cracked this yet, we're still working on it, but the big story is that we don't live the normal now. I mean, particularly not in COVID, but the time even before COVID, that was not normal. That was not a desirable state. Exactly. Not only because, you know, in our societies, we have a world where people are suffering from, you know, from burnout syndrome and unemployment and, and a social system that's disintegrating and a health system that isn't working, all the rest of it. But the fact is, I, I remember people told me recently when we were working on an initiative that they said, well, we have to tell people that, um, that you know, climate change is sort of the thing that we need to tackle, this bigger system change thing. We can't address it because people won't accept it. And I was thinking about this and realizing, well, look, but that makes you accept that that some human lives are worth less than others because in parts of the world the climate crisis is hitting right now and if we have a discourse about averting climate change or its effects here where we live that means we're just trying to avert stuff that's already happening to others elsewhere so basically what you're saying is their lives are worth less than our lives and that's not a position that you can have as a responsible human being so, so basically what I'm saying is the normal we have today is not a normal. The normal we have today is already horrible in many respects, and we need to get to a place that's better. We will not get to a place where the average temperature will be at levels before industrial, industrialization set in, unless some, you know, Jeff Bezos and four of his best friends get together and build a machine in the desert that puts the CO2 back in the earth. If that doesn't happen, we will get to two degrees more you know, with all the horrors that entails, but hopefully we can still have a society that works better because the society we have right now isn't working. So I'm not sure if I answered Fabio's input, but that was kind of, Kai, uh, you raised your hand. I, I only want to add one short thought or one quick thought. Um, is my connection stable enough? Yeah, yeah. it is. Okay. Yes. Um, so, um, and we have uh, huge discussions about that um, about that topic. Um, what I think is crucial for a conversation, which leads to a new point of thinking about the world, is not only to speak about the dystopian state of the planet we are going to, but also the struggles we have to go through to. Uh, well-being economy, for example. So uh, a huge discussion in my um, uh, in my mind is: um, Can we really get rid of growth? For example, is it so easy? Because I don't know how it is in California or in Trinidad or wherever uh, in uh, Germany and Europe. We have a huge post-growth movement where people mm -hmm. say, you know what? Our life will be so much better when we consume less, 
level less and so on. And there are other people, economists, who say, yeah, but it's not that easy. And for my, uh, in, in my conviction, it's very important to speak about these struggles as well, because I wrote that down in, the, in our chat a couple of uh, days ago. Sometimes um, it seems to me like people are staying in the middle of a jungle and say, over there, there's a beach and you have to, uh, you can have cocktails there and there's a lovely sunset. And then you ask them, okay, how can we get there? I want to see that beach. And then they say, oh, uh, it's that direction. No, it's that one. Oh no, that one, that one. So um, I think that discussion about the right path to the jungle is a very crucial one for a very, uh, for a really successful dialogue or conversation. Thank you, Kat. Okay, so I want to say something. We are six minutes to six o'clock. You know that I always try to keep the wheel talk um, fair when it comes to time, but I'm aware that so many of you have raised your hands. So if you can be brief, I would love to hear all your voices before we call the um, the end of the of the talk. So Biki, you are the one. I'm gonna see say your name so you all know the order. But uh, Biki, you're gonna be the next one. Shasha, you're gonna be the next one. Michael. Bob and Sue, and there's somebody who I cannot see a name, but I can see a wide, and you're wearing um, kind of a beard. I'm sorry, but you don't have a name. Yeah, that's you. So you're gonna be the last one. I hope that in this order, if you're brief, please share your thoughts, your ideas, but uh, I'm just trying to keep the, uh, the time fair for everybody. Vicky, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation. I think that Theater is indeed a wonderful way to evoke in people a transformative spirit. I wanted to focus in on the building of community. Um, I, when I'm listening to you, you are both a bit gloomy. And if you're gloomy, then that's not inspiring. It makes people depressed. And if you say World War III is going to happen, then I think it's kind of hard. So why bother? But I do think that by asking people, as opposed to saying there's a beach over there, is what would you like to do for your leisure? Or how is the world, how do you imagine a world that is the best possible world? We've done this in the green market and it works really well where there's no bounds. There's, there, there aren't the barriers, the frame of climate change, which you've so effectively gotten rid of by taking out those words green and so on. I know there are other people, and so I will stop there. Thank you so much, Vicky. Sacha? Yeah, thank you very much. It's been really inspiring to see what you've been doing. I relate so much to that because, you know, I in my past uh, work, I was the Lean Six Sigma expert, and I was supposed to help general managers and hotels understand that. And at the end of the day, that never worked. So the solution was to walk the talk, not use the names and just do what you had to do. So I think focusing on the positive statements and focusing on the positive actions that we all have to take, be it at a local level or be it at a, a bigger level, and just facilitating that with those non-believers, eventually something clicks in them and they come up with this great idea where they're coming up with the solutions that you're actually trying to sell them. And I think that's also one of the, the positive ways to, to look at it. But definitely, I relate it very much to you. Thank you. Thank you, Satya. Michael, your turn. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I am one of those people who, I, doom and gloom is, is normal for me. I, 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 I know we're all finished and we're all doomed. And then I row back from there and look, <laughs> and look for mitigation. And uh, the, at the other extreme of that mitigation is uh, actually building a better world. And um, I was really inspired by this whole um, thing, uh, this whole dramatic approach, because it is a new dimension. And um, the, this, this idea that it's actually quite, just as it's hard to imagine the negative outcomes of not transforming things, it's also hard to imagine the positive outcomes especially if you're in your day-to-day. -day. I mean, I don't know if anybody's aware of this book. I think this book's fantastic. Um, and, and they do go to 2050 and they do present two scenarios. And the positive one is a really nice place to live. And I can see the benefits of drama for that. But I just, just, it's just struck me that 
in, I'm thinking about the UK, of course, because that's where I am, but the, this COVID crisis has forced people, the whole population, to undergo a kind of drama in which suddenly they can't, you know, your transport's down, they've got lots of time on their hands, they're thinking about the local community. There's a whole raft of, it's like it's been an experiment in how things could be in many ways. Um, so anything that helps bring people in, in a dramatic, engaging way, to imagine what possible futures could be like and get their head around how serious it is, I think it's just fantastic. And uh, Thank you. Yeah, just for all of you, I was on a call earlier today, with the Northwest mm -hmm. Institute of Directors, and there was a no, uh, pulling no punches presentation about how businesses need to transform and it was brilliant um, <laughs> but they mentioned several times we mustn't go too far because we don't want to depress people but I wasn't depressed I was elated. Well, if there is anything that a link or something where people can um, reach for some more information Michael that would be great if you can share. I'm oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Sorry on what in particular information? On, on the, on the, uh, on the other the uh, other talk that you were uh, that you joined before. Okay, all right. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and find it and put something in the chat or send it to you. Thank you. Bob, it's going to be your turn. Uh, two quick things. Your uh, call in the, in the uh, performance from the future, the man's daughter, reminded mm -hmm. me of uh, another book. Michael mentioned a, a great one as well. And there's a book called um, Journey to the Future uh, by Guy Dauncey. Uh, who is a brilliant guy in Canada, very positive. Yeah. And what he portrays is a, is a positive future. And looking back to how the heck we worked our way through the crises that we're experiencing today to that kind of positive future in 2032. So just really, really clever. The second thing, I just want to reinforce the importance of language. I, I, I learned that lesson about every second day uh, of the importance of language. And it reminded me of a conversation I had with um, the mayor of Fort McMurray. Fort McMurray, for those of you that aren't familiar with that place, is in the northern part of Al uh, Alberta, or in the heart of the tar sands. And um, he and I were on a bus going to a conference together, and I asked him what he thought about the Kyoto Protocol, and he just erupted uh, about what a useless uh, attempt that was to solve a problem that didn't exist. Uh, so then I, I I thought, okay, we'll talk about climate change. Is he worried about climate change? And that would gain, he just erupted. Uh, so he, he had no time for the Kyoto Protocol or climate change. So I, I sort of casually ended by saying, so you don't really care about carbon dioxide emissions. Big pause. He said, of course I do. They're pollution. We've got to stop this pollution. So he went into all of the reasons that we should be getting our, our carbon dioxide under control, but it was the word pollution that legitimized that conversation, mm. not climate change. So the way in which we frame the issue that we're talking about has enormous difference to the engagement that we have with people that we're trying to um, have these conversations with. So uh, you're, you're totally amazing what you folks do and so courageous, really, really good. Yeah. One more question, Bob. Thank you very much. But what is the title of the book you spoke about? I'll I'll put it in the uh, in yeah. the chat box. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, Sue, it's going to be your turn. Uh, thanks. Sorry, I've been listening to everybody else now. I'm thinking, what was I focusing on? Right, I know what it was. Um, <laughs> there is a great tendency for those of us who've been sort of passionate about environmental change and, and climate change, all this stuff, for a long time. To be trying to micromanage the solution. I think the key thing, and the key thing for me is this is where I'm so enthused by the whole we all idea, is to just change the direction of travel and get other people on board with us because then we can work out the solutions together and they might not look how we think they are. But the, the thing I always think of we all as being like we've got this massive. Um, railroad, this train that's going along called global economy. And all we've done is change the points on it with wheels. So it's, it's never going in that direction, you're now going in that direction. And the train and all the carriages and all the passengers are still on board, but it's going in a different direction. 
we don't quite know where that track's going. Actually, somebody's running ahead laying it just as we get there. But the exciting thing is to change that direction. And I think that's what all this storytelling, all the engagement, and that's why it can be positive and use all the things that the guys were talking about to tell the story and bring all the other characters in because we're just not bringing them along with us when we go out on the attack. It's got to be about where we're going and then we can start talking about how we get there. So that was what I wanted to say. <laughs> thank you, Sue. Thank you so much for that. And um, I'm sorry, but I don't know your name, but um, would be your turn right now. I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. I'm sorry, it's just, it's not showing anywhere. So I, oh, okay. there you go, Christopher. Now I can Christopher, see it. Christopher, hello. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for giving me a little bit of time. I know it's running over, but um, basically I wanted to say, yeah, I really loved it, very inspired. Um, it seems to align with what I feel is really important at the moment. The conclusion that I've come to is that where we need to act is at, at the level of story, at the level of conversation and narrative. Plain and simply, you can produce as much evidence as you want in, 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 as you like, but people are not going to believe it because they're wedded to a certain belief and story. Um, even anyone, academics, the same. Why do you think economists think one way and psychologists another about well-being? Um, so I guess that's where I think is really important. Um, so thank you for that. Um, it certainly inspired me on my own journey. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Okay, so I'm going to keep this last uh, few minutes for Martin and Kay, if you, they want to wrap up in um, those beautiful words that they're using to share with us today. And uh, yep, it's uh, for you this time. So Martin, you can have the last word, but I only want to add one thing, which is really a memory in my mind. I have deep in my heart. So Martin told you that um, a, it was a lady uh, she came to our show with high expectations and uh, we didn't know her, but a colleague of us told her to come and she was so keen to see our show. Uh, connection. Loved. And after that, um, I gave her a call and she said, do you really want to hear the truth? And I said, mm-hmm. <laughs> and she said, are you really serious about that? I was so depressed after that. You cannot speak like that. This was in summer 2018. And I spoke with her a couple of weeks ago and we had a laugh about that because I said to her, you know what? Your very harsh words were so important for us because we knew at that point we are on the wrong path. And from that path on, we had to change our directions. And we had a conversation about one and a half hours, which was really long and we were very connected. And, it was very lovely to speak uh, with her. And she said at the end, you know what? I'm so happy that you didn't take the personal after, our, um, uh, after your show. And now um, it develops to a kind of friendship between her and um, me and us in a way. So another very important lesson for us, and I think it's the same with you guys, is just don't give up. Giving up is not an option for everything. So. Um, we are very happy to come to that point and I am very happy to, uh, to share that experience with you today because to have that conversation with an international audience, it's so inspiring for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kai. Those were really beautiful words. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be super brief. Um, I just wanted to respond to Vicky. Unfortunately, she's left already. Um, I don't want to leave the impression that we're always gloomy. That's <laughs> sometimes it depends on, on the time of day and on what happened to you during a day? And I just want you to know that our show ends with another phone call. The phone rings again. He, he has left it on the stage. He's forgotten it. So he goes back, picks up the phone. It's his daughter who says to him, thank you, thank you. You're amazing. Thank you. We have this new invention now. We, I can call you from the future. And he goes, not again. We just spoke. It's horrible. I know United Nations of the United States of Northern Europe. Oh, my God. I can't hear it anymore. And she goes, what are you talking about? So it's clearly that she's calling from a different future yeah. and she's thanking him for the amazing effort that his generation has gone through to make this future possible. So we're not all gloomy, but we are just humans and we are sometimes more gloomy than other times. <laughs> and, um, and that's it. And like I said, never give up. I think that's, that's a really good ending for this talk, actually knowing how the performance ends. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. <laughs> 
Well, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, so many of them um, already left. I just want to say that if you want to continue the conversation, if you have further questions and you are not on the citizens, on the Wheel Citizens platform, um, you, should, you should join us in there. You should join in all the different conversations and different events that we are celebrating um, because you're more than, more than welcome to as well to share about your own activities and experiences and, and performances in life. I guess. So thank you, Martin and Kate. It's been lovely to have you here. We have really enjoyed. Thank you so much all for being here and adding so much value as well to their presentation and your ideas. And um, we'll see you next month. We're going to have in July, we're going to have two wheel talks and you are going to love them. I can tell you that in advance. You will be receiving the information. <laughs> and thank if, you. Anyone, if anyone still has questions, Anna, of course, has our contacts. We are happy to continue this conversation in other ways and through email and whatnot. So please, by all means, reach out if you can think of anything that you want to share with us. Oh yeah, and the video, this video is going to be uploaded on the Wheel Citizens platform and on Slack. So you're going to have it or you can share it with somebody else. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now.